Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Let us be glad in it. Um, thank you for your patience. I know that we are starting a little bit after the appointed hour. Um, sometimes technology works really well. And sometimes technology uh, that you leave sitting idle uh, without anyone touching it will magically just poof, stop working. Uh, today was one of those days, and so I just want to say uh, a word of gratitude for our tech team back there uh, behind all of those monitors that look like a NASA launch center um, for uh, trying to make it happen so that we can stay connected whether we are here in person or uh, wherever we are. Um, so welcome to you, and uh, we are glad to worship together this day. I also want to say a word of gratitude for um, all of those who had a part in last week's all-church retreat uh, at Camp Saltooth, as well as those who were here um, making worship happen here while others were at Camp Saltooth. Um, it was an incredible experience up in Saltooth. It was my family's first time there. Um, I was able to get the rooster song out of my head long enough to get calamine lotion in my head. And now the rooster song is back in my head. Uh, but we also were still and we listened for the voice of God in our midst, um, despite Randy singing. <laughs> and now he's going to lean over and hit the mute button on my mic. <laughs> Um, a few announcements for you. Uh, first, if you haven't already had the chance to do so, there's a friendship pad at the end of each uh, pew or somewhere in the pew, and there's also a virtual friendship pad for those worshiping with us online. Fill those out and pass those down the row and make note of the names and faces with whom we are worshiping this day. Uh, next Sunday, our worship service will include music from around the world. Um, our Glory to God hymnal has music from um, virtually every continent. I'm not sure Antarctica is in there, but if it is, we'll find it. Um, and um, so come with your best singing voices. And even if you don't think that you have a best singing voice, come with whatever singing voice you have. And we will um, sing to the glory of God next week. Uh, for those who have been visiting with us at Southminster here in person or online, um, I'm hosting a Discover Southminster uh, gathering uh, this Tuesday night, the 23rd um, at 6.30 p.m. It's an opportunity to learn more about this place um, and also with an eye towards what it would be like to join in the membership of Southminster. So let me know if you plan to attend that. Uh, those who have been looking for uh, a shopping list for our food pantry with Grace Jordan Elementary and the shopping cart out in the narthex, there is a shopping list printed conveniently for you right next to the shopping cart. You can put that in uh, your pocket or your purse and take it with you the next time you go to Costco um, or to Albertsons. And finally, um, a note about all that is coming soon. A choir, handbells, book club, adult class, children's Sunday school, our uh, annual pride fest downtown, Presbyterian women's gatherings, and more. All of that is coming uh, in the next month. And so uh, as you are looking at bulletin announcements, as you are looking at the upcoming newsletter when it is sent out, uh, make note of all of the many, many, many ways that we are in ministry here together and look for a way that you can join in. Uh, let us uh, open with a word of prayer now. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, you've called us together to worship. And not even some tech snafus will keep us from doing that. And so we thank you for the privilege of worshiping this day. Open our eyes and our ears, open our hearts and our minds to receive what it is you have for us this day that we might then go out into this world you so love to be a blessing in whatever way we can. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Christ and all God's people together say, Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Come, let us worship our God, for there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and parent of all, who is above all and through all and in all. 
we come with humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another in love. Let us confess our sin together, for we have all fallen short of the glory of God. God, you have called us to live lives worthy of our calling, to which we have been called. But we confess to you and each other that we have not always spoken truth in love. We have not always made every effort to maintain the unity of spirit in the bond of peace. Forgive us and give us grace. Help us to grow in every way in the manner of Christ. Amen. Siblings in Christ, the promise of our faith is that whoever turns to Jesus Christ will never hunger for forgiveness and that which gives life to the world. Trust in the good news. We live as forgiven people. Amen. <laughs>
I invite um, anyone who is a child or anyone who just wants a little bit of a better view to come on up to the front pew as our puppet team gives the children's message today. the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. This is how you should pray.
Thank you so much. Please pray with me. Creator of unity, body of peace, spirit of community, bind us together around your word and send us out to do your justice. Show your mercy and embody your redeeming love, glorifying you in all things. Amen. This morning's reading comes from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. He himself grant, granted that some are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pre, uh, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, or by craftiness in deceitful scheming but speaking the truth in love. We must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as every part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. The word of the Lord. Earlier this week, the beloved Presbyterian pastor and author Reverend Frederick Beekner died at the age of 96. Over the course of his long ministry, he wrote nearly 40 books on faith and spirituality. He helped to define theological and ethical terms in understandable, often humorous poetry and prose. And even if you personally have never read a single page of his work, I would still wager that your faith in all likelihood has been formed by him at one time or another. If for no other reason, then I cannot think of a single pastor who has not quoted him over and over again in sermons or newsletter articles, blog posts, or, or prayers. Even if you didn't know of Frederick Beekner, you knew his work. And because of Frederick Beekner's work, we've come to better know God. We've come to better know ourselves. This morning in worship, we are exploring God's call 
upon each of us individually and God's call upon us as a faith community as well. Considering how by God's grace we have been called not just to join a church, not just to attend a church, but to be the church at work in the world. We have seen it in myriad ways already through the tech team and their troubleshooting, through special music with a summer choir, through a puppet team proclaiming the word, through trumpet and saxophone and guitar and lead vocals. So naturally, in a week that I am already thinking about God's great gift of call, about all that God calls us to, when I read the newspaper articles about Beekner's death, it immediately brought to mind his famous words on vocation and calling. And so I want to spend a little bit of time with that today. Beekner wrote of vocation of the gift of, of God's call, that the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Have you heard that before? Where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Our call, our, our mission, our purpose, when it's at its fullest, its richest, its deepest is found in the place where our gladness and the world's hunger come together. It's profound because in the span of just a few words, certainly far fewer words than I would be able to use, Beekner is able to identify two of the essentials for a calling. Number one, to be called is to live into one's joy, one's gladness, and to live it well. And number two, to be called is to focus not on ourselves, but on the greatest needs of the world around us. The place to which God calls you is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. A couple of months ago now, you may remember that we ordained and installed a new class of elders and deacons here. I remember that day very well, actually, because it was also the day that I was installed here. It was a big day. The installation of, of elders and deacons is a favorite day of mine because of all of the ways it enacts and illustrates God's call in a strange and beautiful fashion. Now, I say strange because there aren't really too many places in our world where we are encouraged to lay hands on other people and see that as a good thing. But I see it as beautiful because it's a moment of great anticipation where we don't quite know where the road is going to lead us together, but at least we know who is leading us on that road. Now, a ministry that I like maybe even a little bit more than that ordination and installation service is the first regular old communion Sunday that comes after an installation service. To the eyes of an onlooker, perhaps there's nothing particularly special or unique about that communion Sunday. But I know that oftentimes I'm going to find among the communion servers standing up front that day at least one server who has never done it before. Their recent ordination, of course, has given them the opportunity to serve communion to the congregation for the very first time. Now, I'll be honest, in my years as a pastor, I have sometimes encountered a, a look of fear and trepidation in the eyes of that first-time communion server, a, a look that practically screams, what happens if I spill the tray of juice on the floor? <laughs> but far more often than that, I have nearly always encountered a joy that just cannot stay inside. Tears of joy, prideful joy, eager joy, 
joy-filled smiles even on faces of those who may not smile all that often otherwise. Almost as sure as clockwork, I know on that first communion Sunday following an ordination and installation service that I will witness a visible reminder of Beekner's definition of calling, of gladness and hunger right before my eyes. The letter to the church in Ephesus, which we read from just a few moments ago, offers us a great view of ecclesiology, which is a, a really big word that essentially means what it is to be the church. Ecclesiology is all about what the church stands for, what it stands against, to name its mission and its purpose, its communal sense of call. While Frederick Buechner, in his famous quote, may have one's individual sense of call in mind, it's really no less true that a community, a, a church, an ecclesiastical body has a calling too. To what extent might our communal calling be found at the intersection of gladness and hunger? I think that's a question worth exploring. And it's surely on the mind of the author of Ephesians. In chapter 4, we find a, a solid use of the metaphor of a human body, which we know is also used in some other New Testament letters, most notably 1 Corinthians. The body, we read, is meant to be joined together, to be functioning properly to be built up for the purposes of unity and faith and knowledge and maturity as we live into the full stature of Christ himself. That, my friends, is a high and holy calling. This text is so chock full with meaning and possible sermon topics that we can spend hours upon hours exploring it all. But for now, I, I want only to list a few simple thoughts for us to carry with us in the days and the weeks and the months ahead for our own devotional and prayer lives. First, I appreciate that the imagery of, of the church as Christ's body can remind us of the many, many roles and responsibilities required to maintain the health and vibrancy of that body. Without a heart, without a brain, Without lungs, without skin, without a central nervous system or a functioning immune system, one cannot live with great and sustained health. The body must be fed, it must be nurtured, it must be cared for, it must be stretched and cleansed and rested. Each of us, we read, has been given gifts to share by Christ. Our job then is to recognize those particular gifts and to use them for the edification and the health of the body at large. We don't hide our light under a bushel, in other words. There's work to do, and it's all important. It's all connected. It's all essential. Second, as an individual person grows and matures in their calling as a disciple or a follower of Christ, their personal growth adds to the growth and the health of the body of Christ at large. To make our spiritual health a priority in our personal lives is important because the growth and flourishing of any one member of the body contributes to the growth and the flourishing of the body as a whole. And for that matter, insofar as the body's gladness is found in serving the world's hunger, the, the growth of one person, one small part of a larger body, also contributes toward the very transformation of the world. When even just one person desires to dig deeper, to live freer, to push harder, like a ripple effect, the resulting impact goes far, far beyond them. And third, I appreciate that the body is a dynamic organism. It's organic. 
It changes over time. It adapts. It grows. It morphs to its surroundings. It's not static. The body is always living into its purpose, even as the specific goals and priorities of that purpose might naturally shift over time. And so too, as we individually and collectively seek to live into our callings, we might find that our passions, our hungers, our joys, the things that make us most glad, might shift over time as well. Now, if you find any of those simple thoughts to be insightful or exhilarating, I don't think that you are alone. We're one body, a dynamic, living, breathing, adaptable body, led to pursue lives worthy of the callings to which we are called working together, serving together, growing together to the glory of God. Our text today encourages us to ask ourselves how we understand the callings to which we have been called, individually and communally, to consider how closely our gladness and the world's needs align, and to ponder the extent to which our personal lives and our ecclesiological mission statements contribute to the high and holy calling that we find in Ephesians to equip each and every and all people to live into the callings to which they too have been called. For Christ's mission is farther. Now here at Southminster, the the elders on our session have started to explore some of these questions of call and of equipping the saints, both from a a 30,000-foot view and also sometimes really deep into the weeds. And it's a great time to explore it as we enter into what might be an endemic stage of COVID-19, as we learn again what it is to be the body of Christ physically together in worship and study and service. We've realigned some of our committees. Presbyterians love our committees. We've considered how to create some more on-ramps for participating in hands-on, heart-filled ministry here, be it around committee tables or coffee tables or the communion table. We've asked ourselves how we might better equip the saints for the work of ministry in the church. And we've begun to explore how a deeper involvement, not so much in checking boxes or filling volunteer slots, but in digging deeper and living freer and serving fuller, how that can lead to a deeper and freer and fuller faith for one and for all and for the transformation of the community and world. As more and more of our ministries and our mission resume, as you heard during the announcements this morning, things picking back up, resuming, or in a completely new way, I invite us all to use that um, equipping the saints insert that you have in the bulletin as a, a personal prayer and devotional tool for yourselves. As we consider those ponderings and the metaphor of the body, as we consider Beekner's exhortation to map out the places where our gladness meet hunger and need, I want you to know that this is not a sign-up sheet. If you submit it, you are not going to be elected to a seat with a lifetime appointment. (laughs) I think the tech team had that recorded, so you can remind me of it later. It's not a simple ploy to get more people serving on committees. Although having said that, you will see there is a place on the sheet if you do feel so called to be on a committee. I have to tell you, though, more voices and perspectives and ideas and dreams and visions around the table are always a good thing. You can see the spirit at work in that. If nothing else, though, I I want to ask that you consider it to be a visual tool to discern what it is you feel most called to in your life and on your faith journey 
as you know it today. Even if it's completely different from the calling to which you felt most called 20 years ago. Consider the, a visual tool that gives a partial answer to the question, what is Southminster all about? What is that congregation over there on Overland Road up to these days? Well, everything that you see on the two sides of this insert are a part of what we are up to these days. But of course, you'll also find a fill in the blank space at the back on the, the bottom. If your devotional and your prayer life should lead you to something that we haven't even yet dreamed up or thought of yet. Now, if you are finding yourself feeling the fire in your bellies right now. If as my seminary professor, Dr. Katie Geneva Cannon put it, you already know the work your soul must have. If your gladness and the world's great needs are so aligned that you want to jump out of your seat right now, then I invite you to fill out this form. There's going to be a table out in the narthex where you can drop it off on the way out. As I've gotten to know you all over the past few months, I know that some of you are in that boat. I see the joy and the gladness on your face as you serve. I see it as you come alive. But I also invite you to take it home, to pray, to discern, to reread Ephesians chapter 4, or for that matter, the entire letter to the church in Ephesus, as you explore your calling and the calling of this congregation anew for just such a time as this. I want you to know if you choose to take this home with you today, I promise I will remind you about it over the next couple of weeks, so you won't need to forget it. It's a joy to be a part of this place, worshiping and studying and serving together for the blessing of the opportunity that we have to explore how our collective mission and ministry here as this particular manifestation of Christ's church that we know and call Southminster, how it might continue to be found in God's eyes to be worthy of the calling to which we have been called. What a joy it is to be living into that call for just such a time as this, and for just such a time as wherever the road might lead us next. To God be the glory. Amen. Each of us has been given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. And so let us give a measure of what has already been given to us as we continue to worship God in the giving of our offerings.
Let us turn to God now in a time of prayer as we offer joys and gladnesses, as we offer our lives once more, and as we offer those things that we have weighing on our hearts as we worship this day. Let us pray. Creator God, when our souls hunger for fulfillment, you fill us with good things. When we thirst, you offer us the fullness of life itself. When we long for what is authentic, for what endures, you show us the way. And so this day and, and every day, we thank you. We worship you. Receive our praise and our gratitude, for you are the source of all goodness, of all that matters. We look around our lives and our communities and our world, and we see great hungers, some literal and, and others in metaphor. We confess that sometimes we don't even know where to start. We feel discouraged or alone. By your many graces, the grace that has offered us gifts to share. Show us the way where we might best serve your purposes. Remind us of the places where the things that make us glad might bring some healing and wholeness to your world too. For we know that the things that make others glad may just bring us some healing as well. As we look at a world of challenges for so many, we bring before you the people and the places and, and the things on our minds and on our hearts. For our earth, for land and sea suffering in heat or disaster or drought or flood or fire or storm. Protect all that is precious to you in creation. For those who face hatred or vitriol or injury, guide the relations that we have one with another, people among peoples, that there may be justice for all. For those who suffer this day with pain or illness, with treatments and therapies, with anxieties or depression, for those who are dying and those who grieve great loss, bring courage and comfort to all who struggle. And open our hearts to offer friendship to ease the journey. We lift before you those within our congregation in need of your particular care and mercy this day. Joel, Sue, Virginia, Eleanor, Anne, Bobby, Pam, Martin, Luke, Jim, Jackie, Lindsay and Sandra, and others that we name silently before you now. Receive our prayers, both those that are spoken and those left unspoken, O oh God. As we offer the words that Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, as we go from this place, let us live into the calling to which we have been called. For the glory of God, let us seek to find those places where our great gladness meets the great needs and hungers of the world. And no matter where we go as we leave this place, may God's kindness go before you. May God's wisdom be with you, and may God's light, the light of the world, follow you this day and every day, every step of the way. Amen. Amen.